What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest is a talented and award-winning designer whose creativity defies the boundaries of the industry. With more than 30 years of experience, she's managed projects with budgets ranging from $25 million to $500 million. She's a frequent contributor to Hotel News Now and a recurring speaker at industry events. She's previously been recognized as one of hotel management's top 30 influential women in hospitality. She's a principal and the managing director at Pierre-Yves Rochon, or PYR, in Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Jacobowski. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Dan, for that lovely intro. Well, you know, with such a, a storied career, there's a lot to get in there. <laughs> it, it's a mouthful, yes. <laughs> It totally is. You know, one of the things I uh, I appreciate about your career in many ways is you have gone from right coast to left coast and now to Heartland. Indeed. And so you've gotten to feel the vibe of like three very different areas um, of of teams. And I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say aesthetic because I think all good designers can really hit anything but it's just it's like a different um way of interacting and like in la it's really easy to just kind of roll into someone's office because you can just drive up there and park new york you know you got security at the bottom (laughs) you got the the person at the front desk and chicago i think is like this really beautiful um combination of the two and with that in mind of chicago being the beautiful combination of the two um how has that changed or what does that mean or how has it impacted your definition of hospitality you know it's 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 interesting because i don't know if it really i don't know where i lived if that per se factored into all of um my definition of hospitality because when i think of hospitality i think of it as creating defining and enriching what i would call the human experience and we do that through design and through service and um for every experience, it's always going to be unique. It's going to be meaningful, inspiring, and um, it basically creates a human connection for people. I mean, I really think of hospitality as creating a connection of people and place. And when we talk about place, every place is unique. And not only have I lived in these unique cities and um, learned a lot about them through living there, but I've also traveled the globe. And I think it's important as a hospitality designer to really factor in multiple cultures and places, because although I live in Chicago, we're defining to tourists as well. We all go and visit different places, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's an open door. I love that. So really just to hear hear what you said, just really it's creating that connection between people and place. Yeah. So as you've gone through and like throughout your career, you've worked on countless projects and if you were to think back to early in your design career, did you always know it would be hospitality design or were you like, what, what, where were you when you were first starting? I always knew it was going to be design, but I didn't know it was going to be hospitality design. So I actually started going and taking college courses for design when I was in high school. And I immediately carried on after that um, into college. But during my college years, I had to pay for college. And I didn't want to work outside the industry. I could have easily waitressed, which I did very early on as a teenager, but I wanted to work in the industry because I felt like it was a benefit. And I uh, was hired at a job, a smaller firm, and we did retail and fashion Mm showrooms. So the interesting transition to that is you're creating um, bespoke experiences that define a, a designer. You're creating a brand through design of a three-dimensional space. And when it was time to move on to another company, I found myself at BBGM, which did hotels. Again, the transition of defining a space, a brand, an experience from retail to hospitality transitioned quite well for me. And then once you start actually playing in the hospitality bucket, 
it's it's a bug that just bites you and you don't look back. Like I can't think of doing anything else. I completely agree. Um, I didn't know you were a waitress, actually. I don't know how I missed that when you first started. Uh, because that was in my teenage years. I think every all of us like waitress. I actually never have, and I really regret that. I, 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 worked, um, I worked checkout at a farm, you know, but I never actually waitressed. I worked in factories. I never... I never did that. And I feel like that's like a missing component because I, I love that. Um, and in so much of what we do, that's like that first human connection. Did anything from that waitressing experience as a, as a teenager draw you or push you towards hospitality design? Well, I, th I think it was that human connection. You know, I'm a people person. I'm very much an extrovert in case you didn't know that. I, have I definitely know that. <laughs> um, and I love hearing stories and connecting with people. And so it gave me that that service right out of the gate. It gave me those connections, those stories. It taught me, obviously, the functioning of um, a restaurant, which applied in design as I move forward in my career. But it also taught me about the ability to move and function and do things quick for the moment. You know, you had a hustle. You had to like take care of people and you had to find a methodology in which to do that. You know, fast forward now where I'm managing a team of people, I've got to take care of people, I've got to design for people. And those are sort of subtle lessons that you learn through, you know, hustling tables. Just out of curiosity, what restaurant and where were you waitressing? Oh my gosh, is this really gonna make it? Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what? this, this is amazing. Why not, grassroots? Okay, so my very first job, <laughs> Why not grassroots? I love that. Was in uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, great. And this is back in the day when they had the coffee counter. And, oh, you know, yeah. You had all the regulars that came in for coffee. From there, I went to Hojo's, good old Howard Johnson's. Wow. Yeah. And then I also did a stint at, okay, ready? Chi Chi's Mexican restaurant. Amazing. Flaming, uh, you, flaming fajitas. Be careful. And I can rock out a, you know, orange fluffy skirt. I was oh, a teenager good. back then too. So, and where was that? That was all in New Jersey. I grew up New in New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah. Okay. All in Jersey. Cool. Um, so, okay. So then you're doing this, these retail areas you're in, in design, you're there, and then you switch over to BBGM. Um, at, from your journey there, like for your first experiences of hospitality design, who would you consider mentors that kind of like took you under their wing and really showed you the way? forward that you learn the most from? You know, you know, I found mentors in many different people and in different aspects of my career. And and, and I still give credit. And I'm still friends with uh, my friend Sherry, who hired me, who gave me my first design job. And she really mentored me in design and helped me with school. So she was part of my first journey. When I came on to BBGM, obviously, Julie Monk was a huge mentor in terms of sort of teaching the business and aspirational. But I was also surrounded by many talented designers and architects, because don't forget, we were part of BBG and BBGM. And I just asked a lot of questions. I had a lot of people that taught me different things through all the various. I mean, Hank Brennan was amazing. Peter Gorman, David Beer. David Beer can design a hotel in two seconds. I've never seen anything like it. You wow. know, so I was surrounded by some amazing talent and I didn't take that for granted. I really enjoyed being around them. And then, and there's a reason for my asking these questions. Like when you think about how much you learn from them and how they kind of, they taught you, cause I know you love teaching others. Like I've just, mm -hmm. I've just seen that from you over, over the years and just from talking to you, um, you love that impact. Like what, are the best elements of those three that you just mentioned, or four, if you go back to, to Sherry, Sherry, mm -hmm. um, that you think that you've taken into yourself that you help, you know, as you're building these teams and, and kind of coaching everyone to be the, the, the best that they can be. You know, I think there was a consistent thread between all of my mentors. Um, whether it was an architect that I asked questions of, of how to build something, or if it was Julie teaching me a proposal, it's the why. It's, it's not just do it this way. It's like, this is why, you know, I would get these assignments, I would do them, I would succeed or fail, but then we would always talk about why. Why are we doing it this way? And I like to tell people, do it, ask questions, try. And I always like to explain the why, because you can't challenge the system unless you know why it was there to begin with. 
for why we do certain things and the value to that. You know, and I always say, you know, the next generation is going to buck the system just like I bucked the system. But you got to understand why it was there to begin with. Well, I think that's it, super cool because if you think about the why may never change, but the how always changes, always right? Always changes. Mm -hmm. um, the why we do what we do, like that's our passion, that's our purpose. But mm -hmm. the vehicle is the what, like how does it get done? Like our, that's, our, that's actually really interesting. And then if you were to think about when you're working with a junior person or someone's new onto your team on a project and mm -hmm. you're, you're, do you have like an example of where you take the time to explain the why and then the, a light bulb goes off like what's your process on doing that to get clarity on the why first i think it depends on the assignment um you know we do a lot of charrettes right we do a lot of pin up in the in the studio so when we're working through a project i always have the team start their project and then present it present their ideas, present their thought process. And then we kind of go through it. And I ask them, well, why did they do that? Well, did you look at this? Because if you do it this way, this is why this works a little bit better. You know, so there's always a why in every underlying conversation. And, and I think a lot of that comes out organically when you brainstorm and work with the design team hand on hand, but you always get them to present first and talk about their why. Oh, I love that. And then, how do you balance that explanation of the why? Like, cause obviously like when you're doing these charrettes or presentations, like there's obviously a deadline, right? So how sure. do you like, I, I'm envisioning a duck swimming across like where they're very calm but the, the legs are going really fast underneath. Yeah. How, how do you, how do you, how do you take that time to just get them to get clear on the why, but also like, Hey, this, what also <laughs> the, what has to happen? It's a juggling act um, and some days we're more successful than others, but you try to factor that into the schedule, right? So when we do a kickoff meeting, we talk about the goals, what we need to achieve. We have what I would call like the charrette session, mm -hmm. um, for lack of a better word, the ability to sit and talk about what our overarching schedule is, what we're going to tackle first, what we're going to do, when we're going to come together again and meet about it, walk through it. So we always factor in those times to dialogue and and define the why and create that and and talk about it mm. um and sometimes we say okay well we're not going to get to that one but we're going to do this one and, and you just plan it it's part of the project planning you've mm. got to allow that time to incubate to create and to discuss yeah. because i think far too much these days we're going so quickly everybody is i have yet to meet somebody we were just at expo right everybody's moving at high speed but i think you have to build it in even if there's small moments in the day. I find that just in my day to day, if I'm back to back to back on everything, if I know that if I don't give myself 15 to 45 minutes between things to just catch up on all the other things that have happened, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I get this really uh, overwhelming sense of just, ah, what am I missing? What am I doing? So I, I love that, that you plan that in. That's, that's awesome. Um, and I try to say, because sometimes you look at my schedule and it's insane and people can't get a hold of me as much as they'd like. And I'm like, I have to focus on these things today because there's a deadline. But what does your tomorrow look like? Mm -hmm. So I'm always trying to be as um, expressive, as communicative as possible. Mm. Um, I want to switch over into speaking about a PYR, PRU yeah, for sure. So obviously French in origin. You guys mm -hmm. have a, a really nice footprint in Chicago as well. Um, mm -hmm. What are the types of projects that you guys and gals, all of you, are are looking <laughs> for? And like, what's what's your real sweet spot? And 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 yeah, just answer that one first. Okay, um, I think everybody who knows PYR knows us as you know luxury. That is definitely the market we we dominate in a lot of ways. Um, we're also perceived, if you will, as classical designers because of all of the rooted work that we've done in Europe. Um, we do do a lot of heritage sites, but we've also done a lot of modernality. And, and I think the takeaway I'd like everybody to know is, you know, we're just very um, defined luxury designers, if you will. Um, and we, we approach every project with passion and commitment and really understanding the function. There's a few things that I will say that I do appreciate about the firm, and as you know, I obviously have 30 years, I've been here 18 months. 
there is a sensitivity and a complete understanding of from the moment that the guest arrives and walks through that hotel that we approach every design. It is not just about the pretty picture. It is really about the human experience. Where does the luggage go? How do you get through that door? Where does this go? You know, and we think about the function as we start to look at the design of a space. Mm. Um, and I and I found that very enlightening. And it sounds so simple. It sounds like something we should all do, but it is such a fundamental conversation. Everything that we do that it sometimes didn't exist before. Really, and why is that? Is that because you think maybe people or different firms are more concerned with narrative rather than human experience within? Or, like, or is it a balance between those? I think it's a balance between those. I mean, there's always a narrative, right? Because that's where you get your design from. And this whole narrative, we always, in school, it was a concept design. What was your concept, right? Mm -hmm. And over the years, it's turned into the word narrative. And that's also been the foundation of how you tell stories and how you connect closer to humans and, and coming up with that hospitality. But I do think it's a fine balance between both. Mm. I'm intrigued by when you when you were talking about uh, PYR's classical design, a uh, classical design firm. Um, you mentioned heritage sites. Like, what are some of the like the most classic heritage sites that 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 are top of mind for you? You know, I think one of the projects that we're well well known for is the Georges Sank in in Paris, and we're currently working on the Ritz in London. We're working on the Amstel in Amsterdam. We tend to these Grand Dame hotels that we do tend to work on, and we do some fantastic work with them. Mm. Four Seasons in Florence, St. Regis in Rome. I mean, these are some pretty, I mean, right now we're working on the um, Denali in Venice. I mean, oh. these are pretty amazing hotels that we get a chance to work on. And are you guys getting to work on those out of Chicago as well? Or is it, do you, do you split it between uh, France and Chicago? That particular project is um, out of our Paris studio. Uh, certain projects are out of Chicago. And in a lot of cases, we actually blend the two together. We mm. do create teams that are the most effective for the project. And it's usually a balance of both, but we do work closely. Okay. And then on the, I use, you use the word uh, modernality, I, uh, modernality. What are some mm -hmm. other ones that maybe are not so heritage, but are like kind of really kind of pushing the limits on, on modernity? So I would take a look at, I don't know if you know this, but we did the Jade Signature, which is a high-end luxury residential project down in Florida and Sunny Isles. And that is extremely modern. It is mm. quite beautiful. And I had the chance during um, the art show uh, to go and see that in person. And I art also Basel. The, art Basel, yes. Yeah. The pictures that we have of that project do not do it justice. The, the beauty in terms of the detailing and the wood veneering and how that all comes together was absolutely exquisite. And then if you were to kind of walk us through that, like what was your favorite part walking through that, that really pulled it all together for you? I think it was that, I, you know, I can see certain things in the images. Obviously I took heat of all of our assets when I first got here, but to have seen them on that and to actually walk it and see how the forms of the walls, which look beautiful and photograph, mm. but actually lead you through the entire space. And it connects you to the visuals of the ocean and it connects you to the visuals of the adjacent gardens and how we took these rooms and connected them to nature. It was really, it was really rooted in, in the architecture that spoke to the interiors on that project. So you're in Chicago, you're at PYR, you have this global team. Um, as you're looking at what's in front of you and where you've come from, what's exciting you most about what you see, what lies ahead? Oh gosh, I think this is such a great challenge to take such a distinguished firm and move it into the next century, if you will. Um, I mean, we have 40 years of legacy that we wanna continue on. And I love coming here. I love the fact that we're global. We have a global footprint. Um, I just spent time with clients in Asia a couple weeks ago. We're doing work in the Middle East. We've got work in Europe, in the U.S. I love that global aspect of what we do. I see that growing and continuing. I'm excited about opportunities to tap into other project types that we may not have tapped into yet. I see, you know, we've done quite a few resorts. And here's a little trivia that I don't know that a lot of people uh, know. Bring it. We have actually worked over... 40 restaurants with 
Michelin star chefs. And I don't think anybody's really known how much restaurant work we have done. So I see a lot of ability. We've even done a yacht and a plane. I mean, we've tapped into multiple types of projects. We've done some significant retail stores for Boucheron and Chopard in Ostendome oh, wow. in Paris. And so I think that's what I'm excited about, trying to like also tell people like, gosh, we do all of this incredible work. Wow, and and think, we we're, we think of ourselves as designers, true designers. I'm curious, when of those 40 restaurants, obviously you're newer to the firm, so you haven't worked on them all. But when you're work when you're working on a a, a restaurant with a Michelin starred chef, do you know that it's a Michelin starred chef from the beginning, or do, is it like a, if you if you build it, they will come? And if it is if it is known, how collaborative is it with that chef? Uh, from the beginning? Um, it, it's not when you're working with a Michelin star chef, you're working with them. It, so it is a true collaboration. And because you're basically building their signature three-dimensionally, right? So they're creating that experience of the food and you're creating the theater in which it's presented. And that is an extension of who they are and how they want to be perceived. So it's a very interesting collaboration in all of that. One of the projects that was still being built when I came on board was patios in, in the little inn in Washington, in Virginia. And oh, that's very, that place is awesome. Yeah, it's very significant of our chef. Wow. And ha have you gotten to eat there? I have not yet. Oh. I have not. I've been, that little inn in Virginia has come up so many times in um, just videos and, and as examples of, excellent hospitality and mm -hmm. i've always wanted to go there and i actually forgot about it a little bit so i need to put, put that back on the top of my list so now you have to so the cafe that we created the inn was created before the cafe that we created was an old uh, gas station that was converted into a bakery and and restaurant oh really huh yeah. mm -hmm. um so everyone's having challenges right now finding people to, to get the work done and really good people. Um, what challenges are you seeing and like, and how are you trying to get around them so that you can continue to build your teams and grow? You know, I think we're met with the same challenges that others have. Um, I will say in the last several months, we have made some very strategic and, and great hires. And I'm excited about the team that we have now. They're so talented. And uh, they're kind of, I have enough people that have been here that are training. We have training through Paris so that we're bringing them up to that PYR style. But I also have a secret weapon. Oh. I love having secret weapons. So I don't know if everybody really knows this, but we're an affiliate to Perkins and Will. Oh, I did know that. Okay. But tell us how and, that tell us how that secret weapon works. Well, it allows us to grow and expand. So for example, the project that we're doing in um, Saudi Arabia right now, mm -hmm. it requires a lot of documentation, and architectural support. Well, I've got five Perkins and Well architects on the team right now. I have the ability to expand and contract through our sister company and get that support. And that's very, very helpful. So when somebody says, can you meet this schedule? I can, I can. I've got all of these Perkins and Well people to draw from. When you when, when you're expanding and contracting like that, um, how do you? Again, going back to the why and the how, how do you get those new teammates that are coming in to help out understand the why, and then that they can do the how? Well, they're part of it from the beginning too, right? I mean, we we do we do master plans, so we understand when we're going to need people and when to start to integrate them. You don't just integrate somebody on the back end and hope that they can draw it. You foresee and you predict. I'm not going to need you to here, but you're part of the team from the beginning, so you're you're ingrained in the design and the thought process. Got it. And vice and versa, they're bringing things to the table that is interior designers. Our team here in Chicago is fully up to speed on Revit. Not only did the team come in, they didn't just help us document it, they helped create an entire Revit system mm -hmm. and train our entire team up on, on that software because that's where we're going. Wow, okay, cool. And then, <clears throat> pardon me, when you're looking at you know, adding to your team and growing to, to fulfill all the work that you guys are getting, mm -hmm. what are, what are you, what are the qualities you really look at in in new te new in new team members that you're bringing on? 
honestly, I think it's really, um, I'm going to call it a positive attitude. You know, I, I'm looking for people that have obviously graphic and design skills. I'm looking for a very solid portfolio. You know, I think everybody's looking for that. But I think to deal with today's market and today's, you know, hurried pace environment, I'm looking for people with a collaborative um, spirit and a positive outlook. Mm. You know, we got hit with an unexpected deadline in the last week. And there isn't any person in this office that didn't come together to help each other. And that, to me, is the foundation of a very solid team and positive growth. Wow. And that, yeah, and that kind of echoes other things I've always heard and I believe, too. It's like you don't hire for skills. They can always be taught. It's really hire for culture, right? You got it. And, and I'm really looking to culture. I'm looking to people that are supportive and helpful and encouraging. And it, it goes a long way. It really goes a long way. Wow. Okay. That's awesome. And then like, just to, to get a flavor of some of the really exciting projects that you're working on right now that are either um, open, about to open or in production, like what's lighting you up the most when, when, when I ask you about that? Oh gosh, there's so many things that light me up. And I'm going to speak, um, I'm going to speak from the Chicago office because okay. Paris has got a ton of stuff going on as well. But if I'm speaking just for Chicago, what we're most intimately involved in, uh, the Waldorf Astoria in New York is well under construction. We're very excited to see that open. Again, they're targeting 2024. Um, the Waldorf Astoria Doha in LaSalle, we just oh, wow. launched. We're going to, you're going to see a lot of promotion on that in the next month or so. Um, they had a soft opening at the end of last year, but now it's going into more of a full-blown opening. We're excited to share that. That'll be something that has a bit more modernality to it that you'll see. Uh, we're well under construction with a luxurious resident in China. We are well under construction for a high-rise in Hangzhou. And one of the things that really excites me is this um, Dira Gate project that we're working on in Saudi Arabia. It is really pretty amazing. We've all heard about these giga projects and they're also uniquely different, but we're really dealing with the UNESCO heritage site. And it's so fascinating to be part of this huge development um, in, in this creation in Riyadh. It's been very, very fascinating. And and just to walk us through that, it's a UNESCO heritage site that they're building a master plan. So, uh, so this is truly the site that established Saudi Arabia as a country. So it is the very first state that established then. And they're creating a development around the original heritage site. And it's really rooted in this Najdi architecture that supports the heritage site and the founding of Saudi Arabia. And it's really incredible how they're holding true to the heritage and infusing a new city and modern ways to this. So we're working on this hotel and we have to do these incredible interpretations of Najdi architecture. It's such a fascinating learning experience and to be part of such a development, that's pretty special. Yeah, and to all, I, I, I don't wanna say that there's no budget, but every project has, does have con the constraint of budget, but you know, I would assume without knowing the details of that project that it's a pretty nice budget that you're working with to really execute around that heritage site you know to say that everybody has a budget but yes i mean i mean they're doing a beautiful job they're investing what's required mm -hmm. to make it beautiful but of course there's a budget you know i mean we go through each phase it gets checked with cost control and um you know we course correct if necessary but so far we've been on target wow that's awesome mm -hmm. um well, I can't wait to learn more about that. And all of us can't wait to learn more about that. It sounds really fantastic. Um, so as you're looking forward also, like what are your biggest needs right now as PYR in Chicago? Our biggest needs, I would say right now, um, obviously, you know, team, staff. Um, I feel like we've had a lot of great hires. I'm probably in a position to handle a couple of more at this moment. Um, as far as proposals and potential projects, gosh, we're so busy right now with what we have. And I, I don't know what the floodgates opened after everybody got back from COVID and I, a proposal once a week, it's been crazy, but it's been really exciting. So as far as the projects, I mean, they're, they're coming and we have them. I think what would excite me or what I would want is more to expand on, on 
letting people know who we are, what we do, and, and doing other project types mm -hmm. that we have done in the past, but people haven't really known it. Okay, and, and what, what, what would those project types be? Well, that would be um, more resorts. We've, had, we've dabbled in resorts. Um, I would love to see more resorts in our portfolio. I would love to see more of the um, expensive retail. I would love to see what more luxurious residential that we've done. And, you know, we've dabbled in, here's an interesting thing, and you wouldn't think of PYR for this, but what we're finding is, is, you know, Perkins and Willis does a lot of hospitals along mm -hmm. with other project types. We're finding that clients are coming because they want a hospitality spin on hospitals. So we actually did the concepts for the VIP suites and lobby space and public spaces for a new built hospital in Saudi Arabia. Oh, wow. And it was interesting and fascinating because we're designers first and foremost, right? And, and we do design with a hospitality eye. Why should a hospital be any different? Now, of course, they have more money to invest there to do more of a high level. But the difference between the VIP suites in the hospital and what we would do in a hotel is the hospital bed. That's the only difference. That's the difference. Oh, and a nurse's station. But that's the difference. That's the level. I'm always surprised that that hasn't happened more. And this has come up a lot in these conversations where mm -hmm. so much of hospitality is how you make others feel. And that's there. I think that there's a healing and a regenerative effect in that. And I just, I don't know why I, that that just hasn't come over to healthcare more. It, it just, it's really mind boggling. It, it's truly mind boggling. I mean, and I think we've dipped our toe in it for years. We've talked about it kind of talked about it, but we're really doing it now. And I mean, obviously there's certain monies that can occur in certain areas that allow that, but this client is so amazing. I don't, he just, he truly believes in design and mm. heal it and making people feel, I mean, it is a true commitment on their part to make that happen. And it's been fascinating because we're not hospital designers, but we're hospitality designers. Yeah. Well, and again, I, I, well, I think why this, podcast keeps growing and, and there it resonates with so many people is I truly believe hospitality touches everything and mm -hmm. I think the more that we can get in take what we've learned and apply it to the healing world I think it will only make healthcare better and and just just the sense of well-being and wellness better oh absolutely I mean if we go back to what we were saying earlier I mean you're creating the human experience. Why does the human experience have to be something less than in a hospital? You do want to create a healing environment and we're all going to get there. <laughs> we're all going to get there, Dan. <laughs> we, we all, and you know what? I want them to figure it out now so that when I'm there, it's it nice good. for me. Yeah. It feels good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, hopefully my kids will come visit. Uh, maybe they'll wipe off that little piece of oatmeal. There you uh, go. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, that's awesome. Now, I, I just want, I want to go back in time okay. to when you're waitressing. I'm going to pick Hojo's just because that's amazing. Um, I, want the, I want the Amy that I'm speaking to right now to appear in front of that younger version of yourself. And what advice would you have for your younger self? Oh, gosh. You know what? I, I was a hustler. I thought that hard work would get me to where I wanted to go. And I would say, you know what? Keep doing what you were doing. I mean, it, it really was about hard work. It was about commitment. It was about endurance. And it was about pushing through. Um, and I always had sort of that, I don't want to say a hustle, but I always had that determination and that commitment. And I never gave up about... Um, doing that but I, I would say you know what you, you were doing the right thing yeah. you know you were doing the right thing and i don't know if i could have seen like i had this idea that all this hard work would pay off and would mean something and you feel it but you don't know it for sure so as the older lady looking at the younger one that was the right way to go yeah i love that I, like i don't know if it's just because we're from jersey but there's that hustle there's that There's always it's, it's the push it's 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 hashtag jersey jersey strong um, <laughs> born, we're born to run baby <laughs> born to born to run is right you know thank you bruce but you yeah. know i i do think it was for me you know things were you know handed 
if I needed it, I needed to go get it. I needed to work for it and I worked hard for it and I saw what I wanted to do. And if I wasn't sure how to get there, I'd ask somebody, well, what do I do? How do I do this? What do I need to be doing if I want to go here? And then I just kept putting myself in those positions. And then Julie or uh, Julia would be like, well, let's talk about the why. And then we can get to the why. <laughs> she would say, do that. Okay, now why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen her in forever. Hmm. Um, all right. That's awesome. I love it. Hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, well, I'm just uh, super excited for your, your new home, Chicago. I'm excited for you and all these great projects and the team you're building at PYR. And if people wanted to learn more about you or PYR, like, how can they find out? How can they connect with you? Oh, my goodness. Connect with me through LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, um, our website. I hired a powerhouse marketing director last year, and she's got us all up to speed on social media. So you can Great. find PYR on any any channel. Awesome. And I guess you're hiring. So uh, definitely reach out. To get Absolutely. Your that would be on our website. Yep. Um, well, Amy, I know how busy you are, and I'm just so grateful that we got to connect here and thank you for your time. Uh, you know, it's an, it's an investment I know, but I just feel like you have such great stories to share and experience to share that I think it will only help shorten other people's journeys. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Dan. I'm glad that after all these years of knowing you, I was able to give you a tidbit of information you did not know. I, yes. And, uh, and I'm all the better for it. Uh, <laughs> and I think we're all the better for it. And also, I, thank you to our listeners, because again, we wouldn't be here talking if it wasn't for you. So if this has changed your idea on design, hospitality design, hospitality, please pass it along. We've been growing by word of mouth, by leaps of bounds. And I'm just eternally humbled that everyone keeps listening and more people keep listening. So thank you. And we'll catch you next time.